<laughs> okay, third time's a charm. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference. It gives me a chance to review some work I sort of shelved for a while. I want to uh, think about it. And it starts from a, something that I've always found very puzzling. It seems to me a curious historical aspect that a motivist, prescriptivist, and a moral, musical successor expressivism aimed to preserve classical classical as opposed to any alternatives. Right. Given the flirtation of the past and some of the affairs with anti-realism, you would suspect that some expressiveness or another would have been the bullet and argued that the logic of attitude of force was in fact not a classical logic. Right? You would have expected that. And there's been some you know, glances here and there, cleaning logics, cool shapeless logics, but no one seems to be as seriously attempted to interpret validity for expressiveness and understood norms, assertions, and judgments along intuitionistic or constructive lines. That's especially confusing. That's especially surprising when you think of the prominence of Michael Dunnett during the uh, birth of modern expressivism and subsequent work by his by his student Christopher Wright, arguing that the normative domain, though cognitivist, makes use of a constructivist notion looking notion of truth. Think about Christopher Wright in um, uh, what is it in that book? Um, truth and um, to the objectivity, think about his treatment of normative language there, you would expect that someone would have said, oh, okay, well, you can do the same sort of thing for expressiveness. But as far as I know, I'd be happy to be told otherwise. No one actually is serious to crack it. Well, surprise, surprise, I would take a crack. <laughs> <laughs> That's my goal. Um, I'm going to start by giving some motivation for looking at an intuition through a category of discourse. Okay. And then briefly the discussion to which the logic and look at some key features. For some of you, this is going to be sort of a boring primer. For others, probably even more boring primer. That's okay. That's okay. Do it in this. Um, I'm going to talk about what an intuition account meeting might look like. I'm going to sketch a sort of toy form of semantics and then give a meta semantic interpretation of it in terms of normative meanings. And then I'm going to show, close by showing how this preserves some of the initial motivations for going uh, constructive. Okay? That's the plan. Gonna be a little bit of here's why you might think uh, the logic for attitudes is something like constructive. A little bit of an interpretation of that, some techie details, and then some showing how that preserves the issue. Okay, good. Now the target form of expressive look at is what's sometimes called B type, not A type. Uh, B type expressivism is when you have a collection of attitudes of some type and a relation of discordance between them, versus A type. Uh, developed by people like Mark Schroeder, where you have really um, a more single attitude being foreign that you take towards contents, right? So B type, you have, a, you have different attitudes, say approval and disagreement. Okay. Uh, I think an expressive uh, constructive account is more plausible for a B type, but you'll see it if you want. I'm going to assume a few mildly controversial things. First, I'm going to assume there is a notion of discordance. <laughs> Uh, such as uh, Derek Baker and I argued for in 2015, which characterizes what it is for a state of mind to be discordant, uh, i.e., in some sense, permanently inconsistent. Uh, I reject the shorter I from Darian. I know it sounds a little, it doesn't have a little evil cast to it. Maybe I should say short, <laughs> short Darian, right? Shorter I, short, short Darian claimed that discordance is an acceptable theoretical premise. And I'm going to assume local, not global expressions. I'm not going to try to go express it in every bit of language. I'm going to think of it as a special feature of something like normative language. So that uh, restriction would be relaxed. Okay. Now, attitudinal accounts start with the idea that there are two states of mind. So they're like approval and disapproval, which correspond to judging something that's right, good, et cetera, and judging something that's wrong, bad. I tend to think of this this way. When I say something like murder is wrong, is wrong indicates which state of approval, uh, state approval or disapproval I'm expressing towards it. And the beginning that uh, noun phrase indicates the action or state of affairs I'm um, expressing the attitude towards. That's how I tell it. Now, approval and disapproval are fundamentally in conflict, and we can use this fact to explain what it's trying to say to be inconsistent. Those quotes are inconsistent. This is just to remind folks the formal inconsistency of the site indicated by you know, the presence of a negation and the non-presence of a negation, otherwise similar, 
uh, sentence types is not enough to explain consistency in a thick sense. We want to understand what's wrong or irrational, or discordant. Right. Right. Um, and we can make this clear by thinking of approving and not approving of something as intuitively. Ah, oh, sorry. Approving of phi and proving of not phi is intuitively coherent, but approving of phi and disapproving of phi is borderline gibberish. Okay. There's a reason to think that there's got to be social discordance there. There's a strong form of incoherence, and I would call that discordance. Um, yeah, I think I just walked by a paper by saying uh, you can imagine what it is for someone to think, you know, going to the, you know, going to the dance is wrong and going to the dance and not going to the dance. Right? Maybe you've got a particularly judgy grandmother, and she thinks, look, if you go to the, you know, if you go to the uh, it's a failure of morality and sort of ordinary human decency, you go dancing. But also, if you don't go dancing, you're being unsocial. Right? And that's that. Right? You can imagine the maximum grumpy person. So that's fine. But it's hard to imagine the same person. It's hard to imagine grandma at all saying, well, I approve you going to the dance and I disapprove you going to the dance. That's weird. Right? That seems like something is going to come too. And this is all patterns. This is not that. It's just to give you a picture of what I'm doing. Now, importantly, these states iterate. We can approve of disapproving of something. We can disapprove of approving. We can approve of approving. And so on. Okay. All this is pretty basic so far. Now, once you've got this picture, there's two natural ways to treat negation. As an attitude flipper, so that murder is not wrong, expresses approval of murder. And murder is not right, it expresses disapproval. So you flip from disapproval to toleration of approval, and from approval to toleration of approval. And we're not going to focus too much about the details there, whether it goes to tolerance or approval. It doesn't really matter so much. And as a higher order attitude, so that murder is not wrong, expresses a disapproving of disapproving of murder. Okay. Two ways to go. Both seem to be a problematic when it comes to interpreting um, these natural pictures on classical. First, suppose we treat these as an, as an attitude. It's basically accepting excludability by the difficult. Why should it be the case that for any content we approve or disapprove it, or even tolerate or disapprove it, our normative stance might be run out radically incomplete? Now, we can idealize, of course, this is what people do. They okay, now we fill out your normative picture. To cover all actions. But why would that be more ideal? Right? Why would it be more ideal to have a more complete normative picture? Maybe it's good to have an income sort of open picture. So it's clear to me that uh, completeness is a virtue of normative stance. And it's unclear to me that if we're trying to give a picture of how we actually use normative language, we're allowed to idea us this way. Now you can, you can finesse this, but at least it's an initial motivation for thinking that something like this little middle might be false from normative language. Now, suppose you treat negation as higher order. Okay, that is a disapproving. Uh, so, murder is not right, disapproving of approving. Right? You have to then cope with the validity of the classical validity of domination. Is disapproving of disapproving of approving of murder? Give, give yourself a second. Disapproving of disapproving of approving of murder. The same as approving of murder. I think no. I think no. You can imagine where you haven't taken a stance yet. Right? But if you were to take a stance, you'd approve. In that case, you might disapprove of someone who disapproves of approval. But because that's what you think, if you had to take a stance, that's what you do. But you don't get approval. Right? But is approving of murdering the same as disapproving of disapproving of approval? Yeah, it's the maximally strong way of disapproving of disapproving of approval by taking an explicit stand. Right? So it looks like you get, you don't get from not not phi to phi for normative language initially, but you do get from phi to not not phi. That is, you get the intuition of the valid direction, but not the classically valid direction of obligation. Does that make sense so far? Now, again, I'm not saying there are always around this. What I'm saying is, if you took a quick look at the language, you would think, you know, intuitively something like excludability doesn't seem like it works here. And intuitively something like double negation obligation. If only we knew a logic that had exactly that profile. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so we have a trouble counting for class probabilities, which list we draw. Well, there's a list, intuition of like that has exactly that pattern of validity. Okay. So maybe it would be interesting and cool to look and see what it might look like if we treated the logic of attitudes, sorry, we treated logical attitudes or more language more generally in terms of intuition as a logic. Stay tuned. Well, keep your energy. Don't change it. These metaphors are all very, very well known, right? Don't really make any sense. Don't uh, get distracted by a pop. Okay. So let me go back to a little bit of basic time intuition. So the classical notion of assertion treats A as putting forward of A as true, accurate, or what have you, regardless of whether or not we have justification for A. Of course, good or rational or permissible assertion requires more. Nevertheless, we can put forward something without having that extra piece. Intuition as a assertion, on the other hand, treats a putting forward of A as A is being verifiable for some notion of interest, in principle verifiable for some notion of interest. Now, in, law, in, in as a logic for mathematics, tra traditionally you're putting forward A as provable in some, in some sense of bubble, right? Has been proved, could easily be proved, falls directly from proof to have a bubble. <laughs> yeah. Acres and acres of thumbs right about trying to catch that person. But that's the idea. The preferred A is provable. Now, of course, good or rational, permissible assertion requires extra stuff, such that A actually is provable, a belief in that, or knowledge, or so on. But putting you putting it forward as provable. Now, it's different so far as the difference of what is to a certain normative sense, but sorry, base and Thomas senses, right? Two plus two is four. Murder is four, right? And from the classical view, there's no significant difference, which it seems to me, between what is to a certain atomic sentence and a molecular sentence, one with uh, characters in it. Truth is are laid down, and we say something like asserting, like if A then B is asserting the material conditional, which means putting forth that A is true, B is true, or equivalent that either A is false or B is true. In effect, you push the notion of truth in from the complex to do its components. With the intuition, you can't easily do this. Well, refuting A or proving B is one way to prove it to A It's not the only way. So the analysis that each is conditional cannot simply push the notion of provability inherent to the decision with its roots. That is, you can't say A hash B is correct just in case hash A is correct, hash B is correct. Right? They don't commute. So far, is it good? I guess it's pretty straightforward. Um, all right, I apologize in advance. There's some very sophisticated conditional people here. I think what I'm doing here can be ported out to a more sophisticated kind of conditionals. I'm working with the really sort of basic. Right? I do recognize that that's a gap in the university. Okay. Now, the most intuitive treatment, this is again a real rehash of interest and connective to original higher, gives a natural interpretation of the molecular statements in terms of their proof conditions. Okay. You augur the line to primitive single bottom relevancy of certain composition. And then you could say that a proof of A and B is a pair of proofs, the proof of A and the proof of B. Okay. So to assert A and B is to assert that you have a proof, it's A is provable and B is provable. Okay. A proof of A or B is a pair of proofs, sorry, is a pair of one of A or B and a proof of B. Right? Do you mean more sophisticated? But it's uh, for our purposes here. Proof of A or B. Is a pair of one of an A to B and a proof of proof of if A then B. This gets more interesting. Is a procedure for converting a proof of A into a proof of B, right? It's a procedure for taking a proof of A and transforming it into a proof of B. We define not A as a proof of if A then bottom, i.e., treat and treat not A as a procedure for converting a proof of A into a proof of bottom. For absurdity, and there is no proof of bottom. Bottom is not proof. Okay. Do the high name. Now, the key idea that I have here in developing a constructive treatment of is the analogy between the intuitive treatment assertions and the expressive treatment assertions. Intuition is the assertion of atomic mathematical content as putting forward of M as provable in some sense. And a complex. Is an assertion of the provability of one or both of the subcontents 
or an operation of the proofs of each, right? That is for A and B, it's a proof of each, or the claim that A or B will prove of both. For the destruction, it's a proof of one of them. For a conditional, it's a procedure for transforming a proof of one into a proof of another. So in fact, logically complex content is analyzing the operations on proofs, um, and the proofs on prime mathematical constants. All the action of the logical operators is the proof of their subcontents and their relations to one another. Now, expressivists treat assertion, the way I'm understanding it here, treat the assertion of something like murder is wrong as an expression of something like the two be disapprovements of murder. Though they do not treat an assertion of murder wrong and putting forward murder as to be disapproved of. And you're not saying murder has the property of to be disapproved of. You're, disappro you're putting forward your disapproval of it, or the to be disapproved of something to it. Right? <laughs> now, the important analogy is the communication of disapprovements as the key feature of normative assertion for simple normative contents. Watching out the analogy, we want to systematically replace provable with a notion of to be disapproved of in something like the above account of the connectors. So that the action of the logical operators is to articulate attitudes towards some contents or for the conditional litigation, articulating a relation of relative discipline. That's the idea, right? So we're going to do something very similar to these intuitions. So we're going to think of conjunctive and disjunctive contents in the normative case is being treated relatively simply. And the conditional negation is treated as operations or relative, operations or relative relations between disciplines. And I think doing this gives us a natural expression based account of complex normative contents. We'll see. So let a normative stance be a cloud of evaluations, approvals, disapprovals, or actions. Think of normative stance as like your current, you know, imagine you're going through a list. You sit there, okay, how do you feel about apples? Eh, apples. How do you feel about bananas? I think it's true. Bananas are the worst. Bananas are the worst. Are they the worst fruit? Awful, awful, awful. Useful, <laughs> useful, full of good things for you. Worst fruit, right? Apples, apples are perfect, right? So you have a cloud of values, approvals, approvals of various action types, and maybe even things. My normative stance, or my community, or the right normative stance, just getting normal. That. Might involve disapproval of murdering, approval of stealing, say from large chains, like Walmart, and random acts of comments. Okay? So maybe that's my cloud. I disapprove of murder, I'm pro stealing from Walmart, and I'm pro random acts of kindness. Not the worst, not the worst. Maybe the best, not the worst. Now, when my normative stance makes a definite stand of action, we'll say that it disapproves of murder. But it's not say just a stand, but it implies such a stand. We'll say the action is to be disapproved. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to make much of this. It's just worth it. And asserting that murder is wrong, we treat as expressing that murder is to be disapproved of on the salient of the stance. So when I say something like murder is wrong, what I'm saying is my or the normative stance of my community or right normative stance is one on which murder is to be disapproved of, right? That is, the normative stance implies, in some sense, it implies uh, a disapproval. Okay. That's it. Now, we're treating the attitude weakly in the sense that approval of phi doesn't imply disapproval of not phi, nor does disapproval of not phi imply approval of phi. No, no, no. The pair of approval and disapproval is a, is a pair of minimal contradictories in the sense that possessing both attitudes at once is discordant in the sense I described before. Normative stance, which are discordant, we're going to call harmonious. Again, I only really went through my slides this morning. I noticed I actually didn't use harmonious. So that's a bad, that's a bad definition. You have to pay a desire for a stronger form of approval is necessary, just add phi and disapproval. Just take approval of phi and disapproval of not phi. Okay, that would be strong. Now, so their aim is to motivate an interesting constructive semantics for expressivism, particular details of modern value psychology. I'm not going to talk that much about this here. It doesn't really make much difference. OK. Now, we can articulate the action on the connectives on prime order of contents. Okay. We're going to give a composite account of the actions of the connections of a complex formula as well as only components with them and approvals, disapprovals, or molecules. 
So you have something like E phi and E prime of phi is a pair of evaluations. E of phi and E prime of psi. So like approval of phi is approval. So murder is right and stealing is wrong. That's a pair of evaluations. Approval of expressing your approval of something and your disapproval of something. This junction is a pair of one of the two and approval or disapproval of them. So, for example, murder is wrong or stealing is wrong is intuitively thought of as murder or stealing and uh, either approval of murder or stealing, but disapproval of stealing, right? Almost exactly our analogies in the construction to interest. <clears throat> And E5, if murder is wrong, then stealing is wrong, is a procedure converting an approval, sorry, a disapproval of murder into a disapproval of stealing. <laughs> it's a procedure. Now, yeah, it's not clear what that procedure will be. Cool. Right? But it's going to be a procedure for converting a disapproval of one into disapproval of the other. And then as before, negation is defined as the conditional with bottom. And bottom is just treated as discordance, right? Primitively discordant states. Now we can analyze that assertion of complex social content as an expression of commitment, because we've said the normative states to the form of a complex device. So when I say if murder is wrong, the stealing is wrong, I'm thinking of that as a commitment to the existence of a procedure for turning disapproval of murder into disapproval of stealing. So murder is wrong and stealing is wrong. That's murder is really murder is wrong and stealing is wrong. So an assertion of that substance is committed to a pair of evaluations, disapproval of murder and disapproval of stealing. Okay? When you put that forward, you're, you're expressing that your or the right or the community normative stance is one on which is to be murder is to be disapproved of and stealing is to be disapproved. Assertion of murder is not wrong, on the other hand, expresses commitment to a procedure converting disapproval of murder into approval of discordance, right? Into a discordance state. More colloquially, yeah, as I say here, murder is not wrong, expresses commitment to the procedure converting any normative stance on which murder is to be disapproved of into one which is discordant. <laughs> now, it should be bottom simple enough. Right, we just use this words. And to get, if you want something more concrete, just think about full on, full stop, approving of one thing and disapproving at the same time. Now, that can be confusing. I mean, it's very tempting to think of that as approving of something in one sense and not in another sense, right? So, horror movies, ah, I like it, but I hate it. Well, that means you like, you like the shock value, but you find the cinematography horrible. But I mean, full on, full stop, no, like, as the thing as it is, approval and disapproval of something seems to be criminally incoherent, right? So a state of mind that has that is one that's going to be discordant. And we just treat bottom, pick a generic instance of that. No. Okay. Now, Here's the, here's the concept. I may use the notion of a procedure and exploitation of our location. But procedure in the math case, that makes a lot of sense, right? Proof. And operations are proofs. If we want to give a pause, example, the wider should accept that it's wrong to alienate the proletariat from their labor only if it's wrong to impede natural solidarity, as we should. We need to become more sophisticated than that. So, what am I going to do? Here's what the real, here's the real ask. Here's where I'm asking you to like take me out there. I'm going to presume a set of presupposed relations linking the evaluations from one sort to another. Now, I think this is kind of familiar. We tend to think, for example, disapproving of modern times, commitment ones to not loving smartphones or texting, whereas loving selfies, as I do, commits one to toleration of self Right? Of course, one of these states entail one another, right? You could have somebody who quits them, but the person who believes the one tends to be the kind of person who believes the other. Right? It's a little weird. Someone's like, like, I hate the modern world, I hate the modern world. And next thing you know, they're like, you know, cell phone, they're posting on Facebook. I mean, there is a kind of person that's right, who uses Facebook like their own personal editorial phone, right? But anyway, so something a little weird. Okay. 
So I'm going to assume more formally the body of information about the commitments and the same community values of the normative stance. Analysis of that sort of thing, right? And sort of draws a connection between, for example, modern times and modern technology, right? Or, for example, uh, hating Walmart and you know being a big lefty and hating Walmart. That kind of thing. Asserting the norm of conditional seems to be expresses commitment to that information base, underwriting treating a normative stance committed to endorsing one as committed to endorsing the other. Right? That's the other. Actually, this would be relatively straightforward to implement something like a Katsari standards framework. You would just use something like that body of information to create a racket on this. Right? That would be what you would do. So, if stealing is wrong, then murdering is wrong, expressing the commitment to the relevant background information underwriting, treating any normative stance like disapproving of stealing as one committed to disapproving of murder. So, the idea is something like you've got this normative stance with this background set of information. You put together the two. When you say something like we're stealing your phone and murdering, what you're saying is something like with that body of information, treat any normative stance which disapproves of stealing as one that's at least in the large going to disapprove of murder. Right? That's the idea. You go stronger, of course, or weaker on this information sources. Right? I said that sort of loosely connected these sort of concepts. You can make them think that they're sort of like analytic intents or something like that. They're not going to be, but it's not. So what, here's one particular explication. A belief that the background information treats both stealing and murdering as general instances of major variables of autonomy and non-fungible goods like life as especially tied to the autonomy. Given this, any longer stance of the one is fairly interpreted as committed to endorsing them. So we commit ourselves by conditional assertions to such translations between various and other stances. Right? That's the idea of trying to capture. Now this is still again as a relatively abstract, but unfortunately, I'm not going to give you a much more precise picture. But that's the formal apparatus we need to make sense, of, make at least seems to me to make good on the same. Now our focus has been on like contextual conditions. Now, we need the connection between the commitments articulated in our information base in order to ground the truth, as they are not only true by causal relations between action types, but some sort of difference in the relation to the valuations we take to ourselves. And we take these to be sort of automatic connections. And again, um, I mean, uh, he, shall, who, he, who, he who shall not be named for Berkeley at one point used the notion of the background. That's kind of what it happened. The idea that there's sort of a cloud of sort of connections between concepts and things that we sort of presume in a way of going around. But... Now, the relationship seems to be to play the role world information plays for ordinary and conditions. Right? Um, so, this is the there's this sort of condition that like requires information based. The source is just a logical translation between the NSC and the condition. And there's one with the much, much looser sort of connection. Right. Uh, and I find in my sort of the state of thinking about this, I need to say something more about how you tell it. Try not to. Okay. So now, given the kind of negation, sorry, the conditional, we can analyze negation in the intuitionistic way by treating negation state in terms of commitments to a certain. Now, roughly that means that asserting a negated normative claim, murder is not is roughly analogous to claiming that the salient background issue commits any number of steps to any unnegated express normative claim to a certain. Okay. Now that's a very strong interpretation. It's a very strong interpretation. Okay. So one hope that I have, and I haven't captured here, but the, but the idea that there are these sort of weaker conditions is to give two notions of negation. Because the way this up here is to say that murder is not wrong. It's to say that given the sort of things in that information background, any state, any, any, uh, no, any sort of value of state that disapproved of murder would be one that was sort of absurd. And that seems very strong. Right. On the other hand, the intuition is by itself very strong. Right. So this is not surprising. And so if you think about it that way, asserting that murder isn't wrong rules out a normative state coming to disapprove of murder. Because doing so would be absurd. So another way of thinking this is, once you've done these translations back into more ordinary 
language. What you say when you say murder is wrong is you express ruling out, ruling out uh, coming to this group. So here's my value statement. I haven't taken a stand yet on murder. I see murder is not wrong. What I'm doing is committing myself to not adding in disapproval of murder in the future. Now, given the way we treated this court so far, this happens because coming to disapprove of murder will put us in a position to have both positive and negative evaluations of that particular action. Some related action are like non related form of disputes like a factual inconsistency in the information base or commitments that can be co-based. What happened there is, when I say, when I have the way that I've ruled out the discordance, uh, I say murder's not wrong, I'm ruling out coming to disapprove of murder. And I'm doing so because I'm sort of expressing that any way of coming to disapprove of murder would, throw, would kick a wrench somewhere, either in both approving and disapproving of some action, in the uh, a regular consistency, the factual base, um, or some related action. Okay. I think uh, for purposes of time and your interest, I'm going to skip the model theory. That's all pretty straightforward. It's fun. It's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty. That's better. Equal minimum. The rough idea here, the rough idea here is you just take the semantics for it into the logic and you just put them in the point of view actually. You take two, you take two normative predicates right and wrong, you just express them and treat them directly. Okay. Yeah, I'll make a study about my laws actually. Okay. Okay. So just take my word for it. You can do this. Um, and you can define logical consciousness in a normal way. Everything else works out pretty soon. Now, here are a couple of features you get. First, our stances are not guaranteed to be silent in the sense of validating that we approve of phi or don't, or we don't approve of phi. So here's a really standard encounter model. So the way we're thinking about these is W as a sort of extension or filling out a V with these enormous stances, right? So it might be, sorry, where I had taken no stance of right or wrong here, but I come to approve it here, okay? So R5 is not true here, so don't approve of it. And it's not true here, and not, R5 is not true because I do come to approve it. So this is a coherent extension, right? That's just again the standard intuition of the cow model for it. Okay. So if I is not approved or approvable at W, but it is at one extension. So for double negation of you go more complicated one. Okay. So it's not true at the base V0, but not on R5 is since there's no extension of V. We're not R5 holes. Basically, you don't always come to approve of, of phi, right? No matter how far out. But it represents the normative stance that can always be fleshed out in such a way as to come to approve of phi, but where this is always optional. I never have to take a stance on this content, but I always could. That will re that represent something like it not disapprove the fact that you can uh, disapprove of disapproving of approving of phi. Without proof. Okay. We currently disapprove of disapproving of approving of phi. We neither disapprove or approve of phi. Okay. So we don't disapprove of taking a negative stand as we can always come to approve. Render down to more. And here's another, I think I mentioned this case at the beginning, but here's a um, more concrete case. Um, again, so imagine you're undecided, but if you had to decide, you would prove. I take those stand, but if the stance itself entails those stand, I'm rather holding a pen by the thing. These are my standards, these are my standard uh, worry for consequential, you know, for certain types of strong consequentialism, you know, so like, uh, how do they go? So how many people here are left-handed? 
and people write it. Suppose we're like headed this art war, right? So that actually, a little like baseball. I feel like left handed people feel like they are sometimes. So, like, so, like, when I hold this over the left hand, the left handed people are a little happy. Put it the right hand, right handed people. Well, certain very strong forms of consequence have it that I'm morally obligated to hold this on my right hand. But that seems silly, right? That seems silly. So, suppose I take those hands, which can hold the cup, right? It doesn't seem moral to me. But if you push me to take a stand, I'd approve of taking the cup in the right hand, right? I don't think it's a moral issue, so I don't treat it as the sort of thing I need to take a stand on. But I disapprove of disapproving or approving of it, right? If you were for, maybe I'm a consequential thing, if you are forced to do it, do the one that makes people happy, but really do whatever you want, right? That again seems to be an intuitive case for something like double Okay. And one other sort of uh, I'm going to close this thing, but one other thing I wanted to mention this is um, uh, so interesting quality, this is a weird feature, um, sometimes called the disjunction property, that if you can prove A or B as a theorem, then you can either prove A as a theorem or prove B as a theorem, right? So there are no essentially destructive theorems, right? All destructive theorems can be can be reduced to a, a theorem of the districts. We get that here as well. So one criticism of forced variant treatments of normative language is that they don't push into the context of molecular science. In fact, that's what we articulate in the Fermi Beach, right? That you can disapprove of uh, going to the store or stealing without disapproving of each individual. Now, for disjunction, this comes out to be dramatic form. It's fine to approve proving this for each, but it nearly as long as you treat approving of final signs, approving of one or the other. However, there are grounds for sometimes treating disjunction this way. If we're in a position to outright to assert one of the two disjuncts, sorry, the outright evaluating the disjunction, we ought to be in a position to assert one of the two disjuncts. Now, as we observe, we have to put a of treated being in a position to assert some equation because then the two would collapse. But how we help neither have we don't the norm of standards are transparent and withholding. So you have room to allow the disjunctions sometimes to get the push, right? Without any reliance on the information background or something, you can say, uh, you know, fight, it's wrong to fire a side. That would be the equivalent of asserting something like a normative theorem. And on that case, you should be able to show that you disapprove of fire just for the last time. With the other case, you have to lean in the back. So that gives you a little space to explain what the difference. And that's kind of a nifty position. So what I've done at this point is pointed out that there's some intuitive motivation for going constructive or intuitionist on normative logic. I've sketched a little bit what that will look like. I've sketched the relation to intuition in general. Um, I talked a little about what conditional is going to be like and talk how you get this sort of translation procedure between antecedent and consequent. Um, I skipped the model theory, but I asked you to take my word for it that it can be done. And if you think about it a little bit, it's pretty straightforward. And then I showed you that it has the right sort of properties so of validating, uh, not validating split in middle, not validating um, something like domination, elimination, and having some sort of nice interesting properties. So, yeah, it seems to be intuitive, intuitionistic treatments of uh, normative logic are cool and interesting. People should do more of them. Thanks. <laughs>